Thank you so much for coming in for this session. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how capital could play a role in uh, sort of the success uh, for a gaming startup. Uh, and I'm really excited to have uh, three of my friends here to talk to you about that. Uh, quick intro for, uh, for everyone here. Uh, I'm Mayank. I'm a partner at Elevation Capital. We are an early stage venture fund investing across a bunch of sectors and gaming is, is a big focus area for us. Uh, in the gaming space, we've invested in Play Simple Games. In their early days, invested in Probo, in Turnip, and a bunch of other companies in the media space as well. Uh, to my left, I have Jonathan from Bitcraft. Jonathan, maybe you want to speak a little bit about yeah. yourself? Sure. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from Bitcraft Ventures. I'm a principal here. Uh, as you know, Bitcraft is an 830 million AUM gaming fund. Uh, it's primarily globally focused, but we have done investments in India, uh, games are up, uh, and stock rotor investments. Before I joined, we never had a real Asia presence. So now that I've joined, hopefully we'll be able to spend more time here in Asia and also here in India. AJ. I'll go next. Hi, Ajinkya here. Uh, uh, I'm the CEO of Snapser. We're a gaming backend company. We recently raised our seed round from Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited to be here. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Karthik, uh, partner at uh, Peer Capital. We are a upstart VC. Uh, started last year, we are focused on seed and series A. Uh, gaming is one of the key focus for our fund. Prior to this, uh, I've been a partner at one of the leading homegrown uh, VC firms in the country uh, and backed multiple gaming companies, uh, co-invested with Mayank at uh, Play Simple and, and a few other uh, gaming investments. So happy to be here. Cool. So hopefully you'll get a good mix of perspectives. Uh, we have a global gaming investor. We have a founder uh, who's worked at a global gaming company, now is running his own startup. And then you have two investors focused on gaming startups in India. So maybe I'll, I'll talk, uh, I'll maybe start with uh, Jonathan Yu. Uh, as uh, you've been looking at the global landscape uh, at Bitcraft and prior to that at CE as well. What are the, some of the things that you've seen as the best practices from founders in global geographies where great gaming companies have come out? In their early journey, how do they think about capital? How do they think about capital partners? And also usage of capital, because gaming is unlike any other consumer tech startup. So how do you see some of these best practices play out? That's a, that's a lot of questions, Mayank. Okay. <laughs> uh, so maybe I'll start with some of the best practices first. And I, I, I don't want to start with something that's boring that all of you know about, about like capital efficiency and all that. I, I think one thing that it's a common thread that we see across all founders is the art of storytelling. Uh, and when I say storytelling, it's just you know, not, not being about coming onto a panel and, and sounding fancy and all that. It's really about being able to understand what the story of your business is. Because the first person you have to convince yourself at the start of this very long and arduous journey is yourself as a founder. Right? You need to be very clear that this is a vision that you're going to hitch your wagon to and it's going to push you through all the tough times. Then after that, you're going to look for your co-founders. Right? You're, you're going to try to attract you know, highly talented people come out of like their very stable paying jobs, come and join you on this very grand vision of storytelling. Then you want to hire the engineers and all the stuff that come along to you. And eventually you're going to go to the VCs and then what are you going to do? Storytelling. So a lot of time, uh, the most important part of the uh, fundraising process for investors such as myself is not so much the how you're going to get it done, it's why you want to do something, right? And the ability to communicate that very crisply and to show that you are the right person to back someone doing something in this uh, industry um, is a very critical piece um, of the evaluation process for me. Um, so that storytelling, I, I think I would say, is the most important thing I would you know, recommend uh, for founders. Got it. And how do founders think about uh, raising capital? When do they raise? Do they raise straight out of the blocks on paper plan? Do they want to raise after they have a game out there? Any, anything that you've seen people do? So, so I think there are many different kind of investors at different stages of the funding cycle. So if you only have like an idea on a napkin, I think the best people you want to reach out to would be the angels, the potential pre-seed investors. These are the people that can make you the right connections to the other people and they're invaluable at a, at a part of that process. As you get to your seed check, and uh, it depends again from firm to firm, Bitcraft writes you know, about three to $5 million for the seed check. It's quite a sizable check, so by then you must have like a fully fledged team, you must have left your previous firm, you have a very clear vision, you've already started building, um, and, and, before, and after that it's gonna be series A, and where you need to have traction, you know, so all your capital needs that you are raising at pre-seed to seed 
all those have to be backed by the milestones you want to achieve that will help you get to the next fundraising cycle, right? So that's how you should think about capital at the start. Don't over fix it on valuation. That is really a more, more, more an outcome uh, ra rather than part of the process. Um, yeah, so that'll be my two cents on fundraising. Cool, well, that, that's interesting. Finding the right sort of partner for the stage that you're in. And there are enough and more people out there who'll provide that capital. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, maybe Karthik, you could speak a little bit now just from an India perspective. I know both of us invest a lot in, in the India space. How have you seen India gaming investment space change over the last 10 years? What was the trend back then? What's now? What, what are the big things you have seen change? So I, I think uh, if I summarize that in one word, I think uh, from zero belief to, uh, to I think uh, gaming being the probably the most prominent space today. I think that's a big shift that has happened. Uh, I actually started my VC career in 2010. And uh, back then, one of the first projects I was given was to source a gaming company. Uh, and I was like, you know, where are gaming companies? Uh, and interestingly, even then, uh, I was able to find some 100 plus companies. A lot of them were kind of doing some sort of services, trying to get into a product, trying to publish their own uh, uh, you know, casual games. Uh, and then fast forward, we invested in Play Simple. Even then, it was, it was really about, hey, casual gaming from India, targeting global markets. There are so many who are doing it. You know, why from India? I think the cost arbitrage and the fast follow model was, was something which really paid off. Uh, but interestingly, today, uh, I, I think the market has shifted substantially, where two things have happened. One, there are enough fast follows that I, I don't think fast follow is any more a moat for anybody, uh, or a cost arbitrage is anywhere any more a moat. Uh, so that's not there today. So there are enough people who are trying to target that. So you need to do something which is innovative. The second thing is, unlike earlier where it was from India to the global market, there's also a market in India which was picking up in a big way. Uh, so that's a huge opportunity. Uh, so there is there is quite some opportunity for India to India itself, apart from India for the world. Now, I think this India building for India is is a very real opportunity, and like we see this in uh, not just in gaming but in like media spaces, just because people are now willing to spend directly for entertainment. The microtransaction market is so deep; it is uh, it's very real. People are making millions of dollars a month revenue just from microtransactions, leaving ads on the side, and that has to have a positive effect for for all games being built for India. Very interesting and. AJ, coming to you and maybe for now, for this question, put on your founder hat and not your A16Z hat. Uh, just walk, maybe for the audience, for all founders, aspiring founders, you've raised money from the best name in, in the space in the US. What was your journey like to raise capital? And what was your storytelling like? Maybe that'll be helpful for people to hear. Yeah, I think uh, in, in one word, hard. Uh, so founders, <laughs> brace yourself, it's a, it's, it's a hard journey. But I, I think let's talk about a, a, a few important things. So, you know, I am born and brought up in India, then I moved to the US. And so, you know, let's go back to school, all of us here, right? Uh, you know, we all used to have these English summaries that we had to write. And the more things you wrote there, even though it didn't make sense, the more marks you got. That was the school that I came from. So when I was like initially trying to write my pitch deck, I'd put so much fluff there. Um, and it, it was all about that storytelling. It was all about can you crisply tell something without the fluff, getting to the point, what is your problem, what are you solving? Uh, and so I learned my lesson very, very early on uh, that no, that's not what VC is like. So that was one. And that's when I realized I think it's a long journey and so constant learning is very important. Uh, you don't come with a rigid mind, come with your ideas, but constantly keep your minds open. That was second. Third, uh, I'm the odd one out here, I'm, I'm not a VC, but uh, I, I used to feel, oh my God, VCs are these people who figured life out. They, can, they have a crystal ball, they know who's gonna win, who's gonna not. And I very soon realized, no, they're just normal people like you and me. Uh, and so just normalizing that, just puts you at the same pedestal as them when you're pitching. And that, I think, is very, very important. Because uh, that helped me. And, and yes, so you could see a change in the first few pitches, which are terrible, to my pitches towards the end, which I think were, were definitely, you know, 
much much better there so i think those three things definitely come to my mind but yeah storytelling it was extremely important i think chris what is the problem how are you going to solve it which team is going to solve it that's all you got uh, early on i could uh, maybe aj a follow up question to that so while you're pitching uh, you, you're obviously hoping a uh, fund decides to invest in you uh, but how do you decide which fund would you want to really really work with yeah. okay so th th that's actually a, a good question and a very hard one to answer especially because see, for first time founders here who are trying to raise money uh, it it is extremely hard to say no you just want money to get your company going and then you have these experts saying no yaar you should have you know you pick the right vc you want like don't compromise there and so you're always in this conundrum of what what is the right thing for me to do and i think i just followed my gut yes luckily for me the the people who connected with me happened to be andreas and arvids but that was not my barometer by any means it was all about when i'm expressing my idea is the person in front of me getting it uh, do they believe in my vision uh, uh, do they believe in this team and do they know where i'm taking this company um, and by the way uh, their job is extremely hard uh, they do not have a crystal ball and so they're hearing 2000 3000 pitches a uh, year and so it's very very difficult so it's it's their job is difficult already uh, and so yeah that's that's basically what i think got it yeah our job looks easy on the outside <laughs> <I agree>. it does <laughs> uh now i think we are also under pressure a lot of times especially when a deal is moving very fast and you have to get to that answer very fast uh and yeah you do get locked out if you're invested in something and that doesn't work and something else did so you have to take that call put your money where your mouth is and then move but but i uh, like i was i forgot to say one thing which is like don't take it personally see like when you yeah. go in like someone saying no to you doesn't mean either your idea is bad or you're you're terrible or they are bad it's it's not that right i think there is a right fit or a right person out there and it's a numbers game so just give, to give you folks an example i did 22 pitches in 6 months um and 18 of them said no uh, and so it was a emotionally roller coaster journey i used to feel like i'm this you know non emotional guy nothing can impact me oh my god you know i was down uh, and then that's where your family and your friends support you but it is incredibly difficult uh, but you will find the right partner for you just keep talking to people cool uh maybe jonathan coming back to you again you are a investor who invests outside india has done those investments and you're looking at india what are some of the underlying trends about the indian gaming space that are exciting like this event is probably 2x the scale of what happened last year right and there are so many more new faces who are here so what's going on why is the outside world so excited about gaming in india we're all excited i agree <laughs> but what is the outside world thinking Yeah, so I think if you look at um, so a bit of my background is I before this before I was here I did growth equity investing for Tomasic, so we did a lot of like uh, investments into companies like ShareChat, Moj, Takatak, Ola, Bati Airtel. So we're fairly familiar with the Indian market, and one thing that we see very clearly um, is that if you if you think about the tech markets as like the U.S., China, India, the old paradigm was the China is about five years behind U.S., India is five years behind China. That arbitrage is disappearing. And we're seeing that the, the India market is really, really good at building products. When we were doing diligence on one, 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 one of the companies, I think it was ShareChat, we had someone from Twitter in the U.S. look at the code base, and he looked at the code base and he told us this is better than Twitter code, right? So I think you guys should be very proud of that. Uh, and in that process, and, and even even look at like ShareChat, right? Uh, when TikTok was banned, within a year there were four companies building short form video platforms. And I think that's really impressive. Um, and I think that's that 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 uh, the learning agility, the velocity of like picking up something new and putting something out there to address like a huge market. I, I think that's like a, that, that speed to scale is something that's very valuable in India, uh, which is why we're all really excited about India. And and if you look at most of the games around today, it's it's very casual. There's a big market for casual, but if you also look at the development of like gaming countries, you look at China and all these other countries. Everyone started with like casual, right? And then it's about how fast do you go up that curve eventually to make a big game. You, you can't expect India to make like Genshin Impact today, right? But my bias is it's going to take a lot shorter than it is going to take what people expect it to be, um, you know. So I, I think the ability to just grow up the curve uh, and and learn very quickly and develop something for like a global mass market is something that's really exciting in India. Very cool, uh, Karthik. So uh, 
uh, question to you just from what, what we are seeing here in India. We've had now success in casual gaming. It's established that casual gaming outputs can be created of, out of India. Play Simple is the leading example there. But still, I think as a as an economy, we are waiting for a large mid-core global success to come out of India or a or a triple-A level game to come out of India. What do you think is, is still missing? Is there an ingredient it's missing? I don't know. Why, why has that not happened? <clears throat> Again, uh, no crystal ball. Uh, just trying to speculate. I, I believe, I, I think it's a matter of time. Uh, two factors which are probably still evolving are the the propensity to kind of just spend time and money, uh, uh, and more so time uh, for the audience, is still, I think you still don't have a large enough base of consumers mm. who, who are willing to spend both time and money. Uh, that's, that's one aspect which is still evolving. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, like Jonathan said, I think it's an evolution. There are quite a few casual gaming companies which are building up in a big way today. Uh, talent is also kind of picking up in that space. There is still, uh, when you talk to many of the gaming companies, one of the biggest challenges that you hear is there is still a dearth of talent. There is still a dearth of designer. The quality of your UI UX that you get is still very, very uh, challenging. Uh, so I guess it, it's a factor of some of that uh, which has to evolve. Uh, capital is there. I think that clearly is evident from the last two years of uh, a lot of funding around gaming that's happening. I think it's a factor of the, the consumer mentality which is still has to evolve um, and, and the talent which still has to pick up on the design side. All right. All right. If I, I just at one sure. point. Um, so I wanted to raise this example of this studio called Neopol. So Neopol is a studio in uh, South Korea. They are a subsidiary of Nexon. And they always made casual games. Then in 2005, they decided to try, as what AJ mentioned, just keep learning and figuring things out. They launched this game called Dungeon Fighter Online. And maybe you may not know how big this game is, but today it's 22 billion in lifetime revenues. And it came from a small studio. It's not like a blue chip background. Like, yes, they were owned by Nexon, but Nexon in 2005 is not Activision, it's not Riot Games. It's just like Nexon, right? Like, never really had anything in the portfolio. But they created this game out of nowhere, and now it's one of like, the most enduring franchises out there. Same for MiHoYo. If you dig far enough, like, this, it's just like three like, um, students who met each other at university doing computer science. First couple of games are all casual games, and then boom, Genshin Impact, right? So you, you never know where it's going to come from. Like, the most important thing is just keep iterating and learning, and you'll get there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing real, really quickly there, and I think uh, the, the ambition also plays an important part here. Hmm. But like, I don't know whether this analogy is going to land with the audience, but I'm still going to say it, which is, I think we, we are all waiting for the Raja Moli of game making. So what did Raja Moli do? Like, yes, there were like all regional movies being made. This person came to the the four and said, you know what, I'm going to make a movie where every Indian is going to rage about it, right? And he did that with Bahubali. And then he created RRR, which became a global phenomenon. So that's the ambition. He had a, a, a sense of the vision and he made it happen. Uh, and I'm sure he or she out there, there's a game maker here uh, who will, who should have that kind of an ambition and then it will happen because there's capital available today. Yeah. I think that capital is almost desperate to find someone to convince, and I can say it like I think everybody's nodding <laughs> very heavily. Uh, most investors are, 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 are waiting, and we have like, all of us have this thesis talk, right? These, these are the areas that we're gonna chase this year. And I think all of us would have this, uh, find that great mid-core team out here who's building world-class level games with some Indian angle to it. And then, yeah, capital is, is gonna chase you down. So I think that, that opportunity exists. You made a great point around ambition. Uh, how does that founder build that ambition in his team? Uh, because that will st also start showing up in your numbers, in the way you're scaling, in front of investors. How do you build that ambition? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It's very tough, right? Like to keep someone motivated. I always say like a startup is a sinking ship and we're all like pedaling as fast as possible and capital is like just making sure to get to the nearest island. Um, and so uh, I think firstly, it's, 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 it's it two things. I think constant motivation, having a sense of here's our mission and only finding people and hiring people who are believing in the mission. Like do not do compromise on hiring. Find your co-founders who are in this with you because it's a freaking crazy journey. 
um, and find your hires, especially the early on hires who really believe in that vision. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's going to be really, really difficult keeping that team together, especially at the start. Got it. Got it. Uh, Jonathan, uh, one next question to you on just from a capital efficiency point of view, like in gaming, you're experimenting so much uh, till, till you figure out whether it's working and then you push, push the pedal. But the other side is also very true that if it's not working, you let it go. You drop that game. You take that hard call because otherwise you could spend, keep spending for the next two years. What have you seen the best uh, in founders do and make best use of their capital that way? Yeah. I, I, I think maybe to use a good example is um, TikTok, right? Like bike dance, before it became bike dance. Um, the, the Chinese culture of doing, uh, in innovating on new businesses is that they let it fail fast. Um, and so the moment they see that the metrics are not working out, after iterating for a while, they just kill it. Um, and when they see something is working in a certain direction, they just keep doubling down on their winners, right? Cut their losses, double down on winners, right? And if, a fun fact, right? TikTok was never TikTok. TikTok started off as a news reader app called uh, Kwai Show. Uh, and then they realized, oh, actually, this, this could be quite interesting. Uh, let, let, let's turn it into a video. And it tried and tried and tried, and then it eventually took off, right? So I think having that, uh, it, it's a bit mercenary and brutal. But when you, when you see that the metrics are not working out, uh, and there's something fundamentally wrong with the product, then you have to be honest with yourself and say, let me just move on now, instead of like doubling down even further into that sinking ship. Um, and yeah, I think that, that's having, having that wisdom and having that discipline to say no and, and moving on is very important. And I think you let the data do the talking. Mm -hmm. I think don't like just get emotionally attached, let the data do the talking. And it's also very important early on to decide Here's our charter. Our charter is building games, but failing quickly and then moving on. And so you're setting the precedence for everyone to be like, this is the MO of the company. And so it's then easier for everyone to be aligned. Sure. Especially, especially once you have like a VC on your cap table, uh, these guys usually know how to read like retention charts, cohort charts, they have benchmarks, what's D1, D10, D30 retention. Um, they will give you a very clear uh, uh, example of like why your product is doing well or not well. Right, so when they tell you that, you know, just kind of listen. <laughs> All right. AJ, I think this uh, sort of fascination with data would serve snaps her very well if it's <laughs> mass pervading. Uh, have you seen that increase in India? Are you seeing Indian uh, founders, whoever you speak to, are they getting more data oriented uh, than earlier? I'm sure folks in the US are far better at that. Yeah, so, so I'll tell you what, at least um, uh, I, I won't be fully transparent. A lot of my network here is all ex-Zynga people, mainly. Uh -huh. uh, and so we come from that DNA. We are, we are a data company. We are not, well, okay, I shouldn't say that on, on, on uh, when the things have been recorded, but we are a data company more than a gaming company. Uh, and so, yeah, that's in our DNA. So a lot of Zynga people you meet, even if they're doing their own startups, that's very much what they focus on. Uh, others, if not, I think one... Well, okay, I'm taking a detour here, but the gaming industry is small and we love helping each other. So talk to people. And if, if you're not aware of it, go talk to a founder. You'll be surprised how many more people are ready to help you than, than saying no to your face. And, and just to add to that, I think this whole notion that has always been there where gaming is a hits and miss business, right? I think this data orientation is what takes it away from the whole hits and miss kind of thing. And even on the mid-core thing, right? So somewhere to some extent, it's also about investors waiting to see, you know, what are some of the proof points, right? Uh, so it's not all about just, you know, uh, you know, the consumer not being ready and stuff. I think to some extent, I would kind of just raise my hand and say, even investors want to see a little bit of that data orientation hmm. and see that, okay, if you're building a mid-core game, yes, we understand it'll take, it's more capital consuming than a casual game. But what are some of the proof points that we'll look for? It will take a year, two years to get to that phase, and only then you'll launch. But what are we seeing in that one year, two year? Uh, it can't be uh, you know, something like, hey, we'll, we'll have a nice design and stuff like that. I think it has to have some element of very strong database thinking, uh, very closer to being objective rather than creative. I think that's very important. Got it. Yeah. Kadik, I know you invest across a bunch of sectors. Gaming is one of the things that you do and spend a lot of time on. Besides being data-oriented, are there any other characteristics that you want to tell people about what makes a great gaming founder that, that you look for? That's a very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I, I would, uh, I think beyond data, uh, a, a lot of gaming founders that at least I have come across are also very hands-on, uh, you know, because of maybe some of the, uh, you know, product building that they've done in the past. How quickly are you also able to build a team around yourself uh, is extremely important to scale. Uh, I've seen many examples where there, there is there's a lot of knowledge and awareness. Uh, and this is not just in gaming, actually, this is across the board. Many founders hate to let go of some of the key functions uh, and build a team around themselves. Mm. It's not about lack of capability, it's about multiplying the capability. Uh, and it's a very fine line. <clears throat> How do you, as a founder, identify the right people and to some extent fail fast? If, if something is not working out, okay, get, get the right people in. Uh, but be able to build a team around who are very well empowered so that you multiply forces to build that company. I think that's, that's a very crucial element which is very hard to put it as a rating. Uh, but as an investor, I think we, we also go by a bit of gut feel uh, and collective wisdom, which is where I think it's very important to involve our own team as well. So when we are taking a decision, we are getting the entire team involved so that our biases don't fall in, in the way of taking a good decision. Uh, so I think r being able to build that team, uh, being very uh, uh, receptive to ideas from the market, uh, specifically in a gaming case, uh, if you're kind of putting some marketing dollars behind the app, uh, are you working, again, working on hope? Or are you working on uh, some proof points to say that, okay, we'll kind of build in a certain direction and scale up that, that uh, game. Uh, I think that's another element, being receptive to what the consumer is saying. Uh, or are you kind of wedded to just your idea and saying, hey, I know what it is, and I just need to pump in more dollars and it'll work. So I, th I think it's a combination of some of these. All right. Very cool. And I think one of the sort of resources at disposal of founders, uh, and uh, AJ, I'd love for you to comment on this is is investors we are not we all say we are not just capital providers we are helpful people do investors help and if they do where do you think founders should use investors best for uh, so a completely honest answer based on some founders founder friends the answer is yes and no not every we see partners as good at helping to, to be perfectly honest but yes most do uh, most have always good intentions because they want the company to succeed. So let, uh, uh, I don't want to paint them in a bad light by any means. They all help. Uh, but I think uh, where, where they provide uh, is filling the gaps. See, every, especially first-time founder has gaps on either hiring or, uh, hey, what, what are the metrics that I should be focusing on? Or, uh, you know, uh, there are plenty of gaps or holes that you have. Talk to, the, talk to your VC because they deal with so many companies, they have collective wisdom about them all that they can pass on to you rather than you kind of going in the rabbit hole yourself and wasting time. And so I think don't shy away from asking questions. I think what's the worst that can happen? They'll say, yeah, sorry, I can't help you. I'll try to get an answer for you. Uh, but overall, uh, just don't feel shy and ask questions. Got like it. my personal example, hiring. Uh, I've used A16Z a lot for hiring. Mm. Uh, uh, it's very, very difficult convincing someone to leave their high paying job at a Facebook, Google there in the Bay Area and be like, yeah, I can't really give you that much money, but still come work for me. It's very tough. Um, uh, but it's also true that th that's where they help me. They, they will essentially uh, have a roster of people who they think might be good fits. And then it's still my legwork, uh, but they enable me there, etc. So that's just one small example of how I leverage them. I think hiring is something that uh, most uh, funds are also realizing is, is, is a tough ask for early stage team. And like your first 10 hires make a big difference to your trajectory. Uh, and if, if a firm is offering that service, by all means, use it as much as you can abuse it. Uh, and like hire as many people as you can through that. Another quick thing I'll add there is I think advisors, uh, right? Uh, because you all are so connected in the entire industry. Uh, there might be a personality that would be the right person to give you some advice on. And I think that is another area that I've leveraged uh, uh, my VCs for. And uh, uh, it's, it's been really helpful. I think one thing that a lot of 
founders do hope uh, uh, that VCs will be able to add value, but frankly, most cannot. And you is functional expertise. Like if you go and talk to a VC about user acquisition, right? What is the best admon that I should? What is the best network? We are not best positioned for that. We can brainstorm with you 101. But I think the better question to ask is, do you know someone in your network who's very good at this? And then, then magic will happen. That network person will be the best person. Rather than hoping that uh, this person sitting on my board will actually be able to answer this question for me. Yeah, and, and the corollary to that is also that if, if, if a VC is actually giving that advice, uh, also be careful. <laughs> And, and I, I think as founders, it's also important to ask questions to VCs. I, I think it's picking up today, uh, but I know over the years, I, I think that's not been the case. It's very important to also ask that question of what are specific things that you can help us and what are specific things that you can't help us with. And having that transparent conversation and just like you know, we do ref checks on founders, important to do ref checks on, on the VC. Uh, who are you taking money from? Uh, Realistically, how much time do they have? It's very important to get that sense <clears throat> so that you calibrate that expectation as well. Many times the problem is not about you know, can do or can't do. It's about the expectation setting uh, where uh, you know, that is what goes wrong. So maybe I'll come to a little bit of a sobering thought, something that uh, all the gaming startups have been struggling with is this whole privacy and IDFA that's come in. How does the need for capital, maybe Jonathan, you can start and all of us could answer. How does the need for capital or quantum of capital change now, now that, that this has happened? So I, I think the easy answer for VCs is that you don't really want to back the kind of companies that are at the mercy of IDFA, um, which is why hypercasual hyper is sort of like died, right? Like Voodoo came out and said hypercasual is dead. Um, so to the extent that, you know, if you're speaking to a capital provider and you're playing in that space, uh, you have to have a very good answer as to why you're going to overcome um, this IDFA problem. Is there a way for you to solve UA uh, that doesn't require, the, you know, the impact for IDFA to hit you? Uh, yeah. But it's, the, the answer is not to give the company just like more capital to burn so that you can solve uh, for, you know, better UA and retention. It's, it's really to solve the underlying problem of like uh, unit economics and getting to like positive unit economics. Karthik? What, what, what are your views? Yeah, so I, I think uh, definitely the capital need has gone up, even in the casual space. Uh, yeah, you know, five, seven, eight years back where it was very capital efficient, uh, you know, gaming inherently, the casual space at least is capital efficient. Uh, I think that is coming down and, and therefore innovation on the gameplay, which is actually very hard, is, is important. Uh, otherwise, there's no mod. So there were two cost arbitrages which were there earlier. One is on, on the talent side. So what would take somebody to build a casual game in the US or Eastern Europe X time, uh, it would be half or even less than that in India at, at a fraction of the cost. So that was one, which is also going up because there are more gaming companies and, and you're vying for the same talent. Secondly, in, in terms of the marketing dollars itself. So that definitely has gone up. So having that monetization game plan very early on beyond uh, ad revenue, uh, at least in casual, uh, becomes important uh, because otherwise it's not sustainable over a period of time. Uh, and, and one has to see is there an opportunity for in-app revenues in, in, in those uh, genres. Uh, so I think some of those have to be closely evaluated uh, before, before just jumping in on that. AJ, you, you speak to a bunch of game developers. What are you hearing people do? What are the good guys that you respect are, are doing on this? So, uh, yeah, firstly, it's hit them hard. There's no question about it. Uh, for some, like, their whole business model is, is uh, uh, vaporized. Uh, but I, I actually think this is an opportunity for new game makers because now I think the game studios that are focusing on IP and, and like, building a brand are going to are going to survive and thrive which also means the true game makers are going to come out tell their stories and it's not just a data game anymore or just throwing money at the wall and then you know you kind of make your uh, money from it so i think i actually look at it as uh, a positive thing where i think we'll see much more high, higher quality games deeper engagement stories um, but while acknowledging the present studios will have to deal with the, those rough waters at the moment 
If, if I may just uh, piggyback on both AJ and Kartik's points is that the evolution that we're seeing with some of the more hyper-casual games that have this leaky bucket uh, economics, the way they're iterating and the way they're innovating is by adding core mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, and that's giving rise to what you call hybrid casual games. Mm -hmm. So today you innovate by adding, say, an RPG element where you can level up. You, know, you look at like a Royal Match, it's a great example, right? They innovated on like the, the Match 3 uh, model by uh, having uh, RPG elements, you can start to buy skins, there's gonna be battle passes, there's gonna be social and multiplayer experiences. And once this trend begins, you're only gonna add more and more core mechanics. And while now you have maybe one or two core mechanics per hybrid casual casual game, in two, three years, four years, five years time, that hybrid casual game is gonna look a lot like the mid-core games of today. Yep. Right, which is, to, which is to AJ's point, that's how that evolution is happening from like more casual to become more mid-core and higher quality games coming out. Um, and that, that solution when you're trying to solve on the product side is actually, I think, going to address the problems that you're having on the capital markets layer side, uh, which I think, you know, it will improve. And why, why all this is important is because all these core mechanics, they improve your retention, improve the engagement. Ultimately, the longer that the people are in the game and engaging with it, the more likely they're able to monetize. Right. I think uh, besides, I, I feel the product uh, being really great to play with is one element, but also, people have to now start thinking about new channels of acquisition and not just depending on this is where I'll spend money and I'll get users. Like we've seen, today only I was reading games on TikTok are just taking off in the US, completely different. And there is microtransaction happening on a game within TikTok. If that's a less cluttered channel, then by all means go find that. And Or Facebook gaming, if that's a way to at least test whether your game is working or not, and then if it's working, its numbers are fine, then you come and spend your half a million dollars that you need to do on Play Store. So, so some of those interesting channel choices are also as important as like high quality gameplay, which earlier were hidden because you could have an arbitrage. Cool, uh, you know, we have about seven, eight minutes. Maybe we'll open up uh, to the audience and if there are any questions uh, from the group here, Happy to answer uh, if there are any. <coughs> okay. So there's a new ecosystem emerging for VR gaming. So what is your hypothesis or take on uh, uh, how you're looking at young studios who are focused on VR gaming right now? See, I think I'll share my view and uh, you guys can share uh, yours. See, I think the the advantage of a new platform where some of this is that there is so much less clutter. Right now, it's not that people have already made choices or bigger platforms have come in and built games and taken away the first 10, 20 million users who are likely to pay, uh, pay the most. Uh, so that is the big sort of advantage and we've been speaking to a, a bunch of people who are doing this. The question still remains is that what gameplay will work over there is still unproven. People are trying to say, okay, we'll have like cricket and like bunch of other things. But what is that gameplay that will really work is unproven. I would say you'll have to put it out there in, in hands of the users. The challenge is the number of users on some of these platforms is still limited. But can you start seeing early data to say, yeah, it's working. People are spending inordinate amount of time. Uh, it's going to be a time spent, not money spent right now, but is there enough time spent happening? It could be just a completely new platform that shows winners emerge away from mobile, away from PC, away from console. Let me just uh, add to that. I think there's one externality there, which is I think that additional device is still not clear from, from a broader market perspective. Uh, so we are, I think that's one of the biggest uh, elements which are still unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I believe that augmented reality, there, there's still uh, you know, activity over there where you can use your existing devices to have that experience uh, with some innovative gameplay. So uh, the, just to wrap up, I, I, I say there are two key bottlenecks that we consider in VR. I think the first one is just absolute price. And, you know, today it's just like I think five six hundred dollars Apple Vision Pro or something. I can't afford it. Maybe I don't get paid enough, but it's really expensive. Uh, and I only I, I really care about mainstream adoption, like the device and the channel that addresses the largest possible market uh, possible. And VR is not there yet. So you have to believe that that price is going to come down, right? So maybe we solve that problem in like I don't know five ten years. 
The other problem, the bottleneck, is um, the, f the form factor itself. Like right now, it's not a comfortable device, and a lot of people, the, the, the byproduct side effect of playing VR games is called nausea. It's not entertainment. Uh, and for adults, we, don't, we, we all feel nauseous. I, I have a headset, but it's, it's just so nauseous. But we're reading a lot of statistics that's coming out that says children can play two hours and not feel anything. So I don't know if maybe there's some general shift happening and then maybe the kids in the future just don't have this issue. Um, so I, I think there are a few, you know, these are like two or three of the important bottlenecks that we're waiting to be solved before it becomes like this new platform. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Hi. Uh, with the new data privacy law coming in India, what is your take on the changes as well as the risk mass management procedures that, you know, in general gaming companies are going to deal with because they handle a lot of data. So what is your take on the you know, changes that will be made at a broader scale because it's a make or break for the company that could be, uh, you know, due to any kind of data breach or something like that. See, I think there is, when it's coming from the government and Gaming is like a favorite sector of regulators these days. <laughs> Fintech and gaming, uh, they love to regulate. There is no walking away from any of these things. It's, a, it's almost you could say that the cost of doing this business has gone up for data privacy. And you need to build it into your model. You just cannot assume that this is not going to be a cost that I will have to live with. Uh, also, the kind of audience that, uh, that we are getting uh, for most of the casual games is such that they can be very, very vocal on social media if some of these things happen. And that, that could be the sort of like binary uh, impact. If there's a data leak, it shows up uh, on, on Twitter, it's, it's going to be very, very bad. It's a cost of doing this business. What you need to do is find the right set of providers. Don't try and do it yourself, like try and build sort of those data protection mechanisms. But if there is a third party SaaS provider, who's actually going to help you safeguard your data. That's the one. And go, go for like the best names that are out there that are less likely to face breaches. Invest in that and actually go for those sort of best-in-class solutions. But I, but I also think that in general, I think we as an industry are now ready for any, any of these curveballs thrown at us, right? Like think GDPR, CCPA. Everyone reacted to it and build some something around this. So uh, I don't think this is going to be a fully unknown thing. Yes, there'll be specific technical challenges, but maybe it's the engineer in me. I think we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, then thank you so much, guys. Thank you, audience. Thank you, guys. Hope, hope this was thank helpful you. for all of you. Thank you so much.